In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the fundamental theorem of calculus has two parts, and it is the, the theorem that bridges the gap between differential and integral calculus. So the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says, if little f is a continuous function on the closed interval from a to b, and if capital F is any antiderivative of little f on that interval, then the integral from a to b of our function f of x dx is equal to the antiderivative evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluated at a. So this is the first time that we've really had an algebraic or an analytic way to evaluate an integral, a definite integral. So basically you take the antiderivative, plug in your upper limit, and then subtract the lower limit uh, from it, and that would be how you evaluate your antiderivative. So just a couple quick um, notes. The notation for f of b minus f of a, you'll often see it like this. So you have like two square in brackets and then b to a, kind of like you see the uh, upper and lower limits here. Or you might just see one-ended brackets like this where you have the function written like this and then from a to b, or b um, like this, yeah. And this means that you plug in the upper limit first and then subtract the lower limit from it. Now, one thing that's interesting when evaluating definite integrals is that we no longer are dealing with a constant of integration. So in order to evaluate a definite integral, right, we find the antiderivative and then we plug in the values of b and a. So if I were to find the antiderivative of my function here, call it like say f of x, and then we had some constant of integration c here. If I evaluated this at a and b, what would I have? Well, I would have f of b plus our constant of integration minus f of a plus my constant of integration. Now, because this is the same function, these constant of integrations are the same. And so this difference is going to cancel them out. So whenever you're dealing with a definite integral, we actually don't need to write a constant of integration. That's why we can just evaluate the function's antiderivative without dealing with the constant of integration. So let's go ahead and uh, try a couple of these. Let's try a couple of these. So here we have a cubic, one minus x cubed. So if I want to evaluate this uh, definite integral, the first thing that I want to do is take its antiderivative. So the antiderivative of one is just going to be x. The antiderivative of x cubed, so it's a cubic, it's a power function, so we add one to the exponent and we divide by our new exponent. And we're going to evaluate this from uh, three to four. So you do the upper limit first minus the lower limit. So basically we're gonna take four and plug it in everywhere we see an x. So it's four minus four to the fourth over four. And then minus, plugging in three, 3 minus 3 to the fourth over 4. Okay, so when we do this, we end up with uh, 4 to the third, right? 4 to the fourth divided by 4 is 4 to the third. So that's 64. So 4 minus 64 is negative 60 minus uh, 3 to the fourth is 81 over, this is 81 over 4. Uh, so if you do 3 minus 81 over 4, that ends up being negative 17.25. So we're subtracting negative 17.25. Uh, you could have left it as a uh, fraction if you would like. But as a decimal, we end up with this. So these turn into addition. And we get that the integral from 3 to 4 of 1 minus x cubed with respect to x is equal to negative 42. 0.75. Okay. So in this one, we want to evaluate this definite integral, and it's going from pi to 2 pi, and we're integrating negative sine of x dx. So what function's derivative would be negative sine of x? Well, that's going to be a positive cosine. You could have pulled this out, but we know that when we take the derivative of positive cosine, we get negative sine as a result. So the antiderivative of just sine, a positive sine is negative cosine. Taking its opposite makes us, uh, gives us a positive cosine. So this is gonna be equal to uh, the cosine of x. And then we're gonna evaluate this from uh, pi to two pi. So remember you plug in your upper limit first. So it's the cosine of two pi minus the lower limit, cosine of pi. 
So cosine at 2 pi, the x coordinate at 2 pi is 1. The x coordinate at pi is negative 1. So 1 minus a negative 1, that will be uh, equal to 2. So the integral from pi to 2 pi of negative sine of x dx is equal to 2. Okay. Now this one's a little trickier um, because we have an absolute value here. Uh, our absolute value is going from 1 to 3, but we still need to um, evaluate this. We need to figure out where this is going to be negative because the absolute value basically is going to make it always be positive. So if we figure out where this is negative, then we are going to basically have to reflect, uh, take the opposite of our function on that interval. So where is this equal to 0? So we know x squared minus 4 is equal to 0 um, when x is equal to plus or minus 2. Now, since we're only going from 1 to 3, we only care about at x equals 2. So what does this graph look like? So graphically, this is basically just your normal y equals x squared parabola, right? So if we were looking at the uh, coordinate plane here, it would look like our normal uh, y equals x squared minus 4. So we would have this function like this, right? Normally it comes something like this. But the absolute value is going to make this part down here kind of flip up uh, over the x-axis like this. So your graph does something like like this. It comes down to where we would have had our x-intercept. And then it comes up like this. And then it finishes out its parabola shape like that. OK? So that's what the graph of this looks like. Now, we know that these x-intercepts are at negative 2 and positive 2. And we want to integrate from 1 to 3. So we're going from here to here. So basically, I'm trying to find this area there. Now, when you're looking at the graph of this, the graph that we have on the outside, right, when for x greater than 2 and for x less than 2, that's just the graph of y equals x squared minus 4. But this inside part here, from in between negative 2 and 2, that's the graph of the opposite of this, right? And that's for values of x in between negative 2 and 2. So if we rewrote this absolute value, right, it would be equal to x squared minus 4 for x values less than negative 2 and for x values greater than 2. And then it would equal the opposite of that for x values in between negative 2 and 2. Um, so we're going to have to set up two integrals in this. So the first integral is going to go from 1 to 2, right? Because we're using basically this part of our graph there. So we're going to go from 1 to 2, and that's going to be using this function here. So I'll just distribute the negative through, negative x squared plus 4, integrating with respect to x. And then we're going to add uh, the integral from 2 to 3 of our normal function, just the normal x squared minus 4 integrated with respect to x. OK, so go ahead and do this antiderivative here. So the negative x squared, that's antiderivative is going to be negative x cubed over 3. Uh, the 4 is going to end up being um, 4x. OK, so we're going to go from 2 to 1. And we're going to add the other antiderivative. So it's going to be x cubed over 3 here. And then this time minus 4x. And we're going from now 2 to 3. All right. So going through the process, uh, let's go ahead and plug in. So if I plugged in 2, that's going to give me negative 8 thirds plus 8 minus 1 cubed, so that's going to be negative 1 third uh, plus 4. So that's the first part. And then adding the second one, that's going to be positive 8 thirds. And then this time it's going to be minus, oh, whoops, sorry. That's the lower limit. Plugging in 3, 3 cubed is 27. 27 over 3, that's 9. Uh, 9 minus 12 
minus, and then plugging in, this is going to be 8 thirds, this time minus 8. OK, so we can distribute through. So we have these negatives in here. So once we combine everything, right? So once you do all your arithmetic and you clean all this up, uh, this whole thing here on the left side turns out to be 5 thirds. And then this piece here on the right side turns out to be 7 thirds. And when you add 5 thirds plus 7 thirds, we're going to end up with 12 over 3, which is just equal to 4. So this whole thing is equal to four units. Um, all right. So in number two, example two, we're asked to find the area of the uh, region bounded by y equals x cubed plus two divided by four, um, the x-axis and the lines x equals zero and x equals two. So basically what this is asking you, right, you have uh, some cubic curve here. So you have some cubic curve like this. It's bound between um, x equals 0, x equals 2, the function, and the x-axis here. So we're just still looking for the area but underneath that curve, right, in between 0 and 2. So essentially, this is what you're looking for uh, in this. So we, we will go ahead and just use this information to write our definite integral. So since we're starting at 0 and going to 2, those are our limits of integration. So we have the integral from 0 to 2 of this function here. So x cubed plus 2 all divided by 4. Uh, we're integrating with respect to x. And since it's bound between the x-axis and this function, this is just what we're looking at here. Now this 4 here, I can actually factor it out to uh, because it's a constant. So I can factor it out in the form of a 1 fourth because this is 1 fourth times uh, the integral from 0 to 2 of this cubic, x cubed plus 2, integrated with respect to x. OK, so what does this look like? So it's 1 fourth times, this is going to be x to the fourth over 4. And then this is going to be 2x evaluated from 0 to 2. OK, so it's 1 fourth times this whole thing. So plugging in 2, uh, 2 to the 4th, that's 16 divided by 4 is 4 plus 4. And then minus plugging in 0, that's going to be 0 plus 0, 0 plus 0. So we have 8, a quarter of 8 is what we're looking at here, which is 2. So then this integral here is just equal to 2. So now that we have a way to evaluate a definite integral, we actually are able to do some interesting things with it. So one of the things that we can do now that we know how to evaluate a definite integral is to actually find the average value of a function over some interval from A to B. So this is called the average or the mean value theorem for definite integrals. So if you see uh, them talking about the mean value theorem for integrals, this is what it's asking you for. So it says if f is a continuous function on the interval from a to b, then at some point c in our closed interval, the function's value at c is equal to 1 over b minus a times the integral from b to a, or from a to b, sorry, of f of x with respect to x. Now, one thing to note is that f of c is basically just the height of some rectangle whose area is precisely equal to the area under the curve, under the curve. And then the value of f of c here is the average value of our function, OK? So it's the average of all of our y values. It's the average of all of our y values. So let's go ahead and give this a shot. Let's try something with the average value theorem. So we want to find the average value of our function f of x is equal to uh, 4 minus x squared on the interval from 0 to 3 and then figure out at what value of c, if any, does f take on this average value in the given interval. So we have f of c. So we're told that the function's value at some number c is equal to 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So let's go ahead and put in all the information that we know. 
Uh, so we know that this is a, this is b, this is f of x. So f of some value c is equal to 1 over 3 minus 0 times the integral from 0 to 3 of our function 4 minus x squared with respect to x. So that's going to be 1 third times this integral here. So go ahead and do the antiderivative. So that's going to be 4x. And then this is going to be x cubed over 3. And we're evaluating this from 0 to 3. OK, so what do we get? Ultimately, we have 1 third times. So plugging in 3, that's going to be 12 minus uh, 3 cubed is 27 divided by 3 is 9. So 12 minus 9 minus plugging in zeros, I'm going to get 0 uh, minus 0. So that's 12 minus 9, that's 3. A third of 3 is going to be 1. So in this, we know that f of c is equal to 1. OK, so this is uh, the value, the average value of our function. But now we want to know, is there anywhere in the interval that we're looking at, right, from 0 to 3, where the function is equal to the average value? Because that's what this next part says. At what value of c, if any, does f actually take on this average value? So basically, we want to evaluate where is this equal to 1. So we want to know where is f of c equal to 1. Essentially, this just means where is 4 minus x squared equal to 1. So solve this. So I can subtract the 4 over and divide. So I'm going to get that x squared is equal to 3. So then take the square root and we get that x is equal to plus or minus. Actually, sorry, this should be a c here because we're evaluating f of c. So this is saying uh, c squared. So c is equal to plus or minus the square root of 3. So again, we're looking for c to be in the interval from 0 to 3. So only one of these meets that, uh, which is the positive version. So that's going to be c is equal to the positive square root of 3. So at the square root of 3 is when this function on this interval takes on its average value.